Hi, welcome to another presentation on ecology and this time we're going to take a closer look at food chains and food webs. As in a previous presentation, I've already introduced the concept of a food chain with the producers and the consumers. So we're going to be looking more in the food web and also the energy transfers. Now this is an example of a food web. A food web is basically made of many different food chains all connected to one another. So in a food web, what can be classified as, for example, a secondary consumer may actually also be a primary consumer in a different food chain. Right. Now let's take a look at what I mean. If we take a look at the phytoplankton in this food web. This is a marine food web in water where phytoplankton count as the producers. The phytoplankton are trophic level number one and they can be eaten by euphorcids, krill, that's basically like uh, tiny little prawns or the copepods. That's called um, trophic level two. But if you look at this arrow over here. The krill also counts as trophic level 3 if we look at a different food chain here. So there's one food chain in which the krill counts as the second trophic level or primary consumer. There's also another food chain in which the krill counts as the secondary consumer the third trophic level. Okay, now let's continue with something else we mentioned previously about energy transfer. So to recap, energy transfer in a food chain or food web is quite uh, wasteful, let's put it that way. Only approximately 10% of energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. There's a lot of uh, loss of energy in the form of heat to the surroundings. There's a lot of energy loss in the form of feces that we poop out without actually absorbing. There is also a loss of energy in the food that we don't actually eat. For example, the bones and feathers of animals that we ate only for the meat. So with all that loss of energy, there's a limited or finite amount of energy that can be transferred from one to another. Within a trophic level, suppose the plant over here were to obtain its energy from the sun by absorbing it during photosynthesis. Let's say it starts out with a certain amount of energy. I'm going to say 1,000 arbitrary units of energy or perhaps I would put here Joule that's the unit for energy the herbivore eating that one plant may be assumed to only obtain 100 Joules of energy and if this carnivore eats that herbivore it would only get approximately 10 Joules of energy and if we continue taking only 10% for each one, this essentially means at the top, the final consumer gets only 0 0.1 joule of energy from what was originally 1,000 joules. Now, this is not to say that the carnivore is only getting 0 0.1 joule every time it eats the snake for example in this case there's an eagle eating the snake this picture and these numbers does not mean that the eagle is getting only 0 0.1 joule from the snake no it gets a lot more energy from the snake after all the snake is quite a big animal what we are saying is that this 0 0.1 joule originally came from the plant at the beginning of the food chain so from here we can see that an eagle would have to eat a certain number of snakes, but the snake would have to eat a larger number of rats or shrews, which would have to eat a larger number of insects. 
and the larger number of insects would have to eat the much larger number of plants. This is the only way to sustain the food chain. The only way to sustain the food chain is if we have these pyramid-shaped numbers, pyramid-shaped population. Starting from the plant, there should be a much larger population. And as we go to the next trophic level and the next, the population dwindles. This is what we would call a normal pyramid, a classic pyramid. There are some cases where the pyramids may look very, very different, but we won't go there for now, for lower secondary signs. The takeaway here is that in any food chain, we're going to assume the sun is the principal source of energy because the sun's light is absorbed by plants through photosynthesis and that produces the food, which becomes the basis of all the food within any food chain. Okay? All right. Now this picture shows the energy flow in an ecosystem. Here, you can see that there are two different arrows, color-coded. The blue arrow represents chemical cycling. Now, what does that mean? Chemicals refers to matter, and all atoms are matter, all molecules are matter. Anything physical object is considered matter. Matter, chemicals, we start off by thinking of carbon dioxide and water. H2O, CO2, they are absorbed by producers through photosynthesis and used to make food, which is usually we're going to think of as sugar. So I'm going to write C6, H12O6, that's the chemical formula for glucose, sugar. Of course, the glucose is not the only thing within a plant. The plant will use this to make a lot of other things. It will use it to make oils, it will use it to make proteins. Whatever it is used to make though, they all came from here. Now there are some other nutrients that are absorbed by the plants. From the soil, they get other mineral ions. We've got the nitrates, for example, absorbed into the plant through the roots. And we've got metal ions, for example, say magnesium ions absorbed into the plants. Whatever the case, we are going to think of the producers, the plants, as taking in atoms, molecules, gathering into its body and using it to make food. Now, when an animal, a consumer, eats or consumes, we see that the chemicals are now transferred into the primary consumer. So in this way, the primary consumer has the chance to gather those atoms and molecules and use it to build their bodies. The same process repeats with more consumers, secondary and tertiary consumers. And in every level, there are losses here, here and here. To form the treatise, these are the uneaten parts or the waste products, the feces that may be pooped out by animals. These are also actual things. These are chemicals which were not used or not consumed. That can be consumed by the treaty force or scavengers. They can also be consumed by decomposers. Now, if that were to happen, that would be returned to the environment like this, using this arrow over here to represent the return of simple molecules into the environment, which in the end cycle through and can be absorbed by the primary producers again. At every trophic level, every consumer will also be breathing out, peeing out water, breathing out carbon dioxide, and these are also recycled by the plant through photosynthesis. If, in the event that the chemicals can be simply broken down through exposure to the elements, meaning exposure to sun and rain and all that, the detritus may also break down on their own, and that gets all cycled back into the plants, and they reabsorb those things to make more food. And so the cycle repeats. So when we talk about chemicals within a food chain, 
there is a cycling. The chemicals are recycled within the food chain or within the food web. Okay. Now, what about energy? Looking at this orange or red arrow, energy flow is not cyclical. As you can see from this picture, there are a lot of squiggly lines over here that represent heat. Let me explain. When light energy is absorbed by the uh, uh, plant, the plant absorbs it through photosynthesis. Where did the energy go? As you may have learned before, energy cannot be destroyed. Energy only transforms to other forms. So in this case, the chemical energy in the plant is considered where the energy went. So the light energy is transformed into what we call chemical energy. The chemical energy is trapped within food, sugars mostly, proteins, oils, all these molecules, things that we eat, they contain the chemical energy that was originally light energy, now trapped within the form of complex molecules. The plant, however, will use up some of that energy immediately for its own survival. They still need to do things like grow and reproduce. In doing so, they will be using some energy up. And where will the energy go? They will be lost to the surroundings as heat energy. Whenever other animals eat the plant, they also do the same thing. Some of the energy is used up in daily activities, such as running, walking, and that energy is lost also as heat. The same thing happens at every energy transfer point. For every organism, there is some loss of energy in the form of heat. And the thing about heat energy is that it is very uh, chaotic. It can't be reused. Once lost as heat, forever it will be gone as heat. It will not easily be converted into any other form of energy. Not to say it can't, but very unlikely. So, because of this, we see that energy flow is non-cyclical in nature. At every trophic level, energy is used for respiration, life processes and movement, some energy is lost through waste products and undigested matter. And it is important for you to know energy loss is a one-way thing, non-cyclical. Because of this and because of the energy loss from one trophic level to the next trophic level, there is this rule of thumb in biology. The longer the food chain, the smaller the amount of energy that's transferred to the final consumer. In order to sustain a long food chain, there has to be a lot of plants, a lot of animals at the lower trophic levels. Because of this, that's not very sustainable. Because of this, the food chains are generally very short. And the most efficient food chains tend to be ones where there are more animals capable of directly eating plants. In other words, herbivores. Because herbivores, the primary consumers, receive the most amount of energy directly from the plants. Okay, right. So, To tap it all off, to top it all off, nutrients are continuously recycled between living organisms and the environment. Nutrients here refer to things like the atoms, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, water. These are atoms and molecules and ions. Nutrients are recycled, but energy is not.